Good morning, everyone. Um, this is Elizabeth Jenks from the Developmental Disabilities Institute. We are at week eight of our nine-part webinar series. Um, and uh, I'd like to say good morning to everyone. And in a minute, I'm going to introduce our speaker today, uh, Mr. Michael Bray. Uh, but before that, I'd just like to touch base about a couple of things. Again, just a friendly reminder, the homework is due by Tuesdays at 5 p.m. Um, and we'd like to adhere to that. We are giving continuing education credits and we're monitoring uh, very closely who is participating. And to complete and get the CEs, including the one credit uh, pain management one that was offered from the first webinar series, the, the very first one we did, you need to participate in all of the weeks and also complete the homework assignment and get it into us. So, and I'm going to talk more extensively about that next week, how we're going to track your CEs, how we can help you with that process, what you need to do. Um, those of you that will be getting certificates, um, again, we're going to cover more of that next week on our last week when Mr. Uh, Andrew Robinson is with us to talk about advocacy. Um, I'd like to also, one last request. We We've had participants. I'm looking for a couple of more folks for our focus group, which will help us uh, do an evaluation of the webinar process um, and kind of give us a way to improve it for the next time we offer it. So I'd like a couple of folks who participated in all of the uh, webinars and, and are able to include that will be next week as well, who are in the metropolitan Detroit area who will be available on May 19th from 1030 until noon. We are giving a $50 gift card to participate. We are feeding you a nice warm lunch um, and we'd love to have you participate on the focus group. Again, we're looking for two to three more people. So if you want to be one of those uh, focus group participants, you can shoot me an email at e.janks, J-A-N-K-S, at Wayne. At edu within the next couple of days. Thank you. Um, I'd like to introduce Michael today who's going to talk about post-secondary opportunities for students with disabilities. Um, Michael Bray has worked at the Developmental Disabilities Institute for over 10 years. He's the disseminator, dissemination coordinator at DDI. He has a master's degree from Wayne State University in psychology. He's currently the project coordinator for the empowerment education consumer-driven training for Michigan Direct Support Professionals Initiative. This is a statewide project that supports training for direct care workers. He serves on the National Alliance of the Direct Support Professionals uh, National Committee, and his other area of interest and area of expertise is in having students with learning disabilities and other challenges succeed in post-secondary settings. He leads and coordinates a peer mentorship project through a Wayne State University and DDI Collaborative, the Student Sharing Success Learning Community, that helps students with learning challenges be optimal students. He also collaborates with other colleges to de develop similar projects. Today, we'll share his expertise with all of you to help make post-secondary experiences a reality for students with disabilities. I'll move over to you, Mike. Hey everyone, just getting set up here. Let me uh, show my screen. That might help. Okay. Um, thank you, Elizabeth, for that introduction. I my work here has varied considerably over the years, uh, but in the last, I'd say five or so, six years, um, really focused more on. Uh, issues in higher education, uh, especially as they relate to students with developmental and intellectual disabilities. Uh, and today I'm just going to talk a little bit about that work um, and I'll also discuss, uh, try to give you a, a picture of what's going on nationally uh, around this issue and uh, efforts that are being made to uh, increase the efforts um, or increase the opportunities rather for students with disabilities uh, as they pertain to uh, higher education, post-secondary education. So just a few things to start out here. Get this going. Uh, just a little bit about DDI. I, I, I always like to start out just kind of explaining uh, where we sit in the land, Michigan's landscape of disability service and research. Uh, and also uh, uh, 
to just give an idea of the work we do, uh, not only in the topic we'll discuss today, but in, in, in other areas of disability and uh, advocacy, um, uh, research, and training. Um, so we provide education uh, to individuals with disabilities. Uh, we're part of a, a national network of 67 university centers. There's one of us in each state and territory in the U.S. Um, you know, we serve the state of Michigan. Um, we work with individuals across the lifespan. Some of this is old news to a lot of you uh, that, are, that we've worked with over the years. Um, but we provide education to individuals uh, with disabilities, professionals, paraprofessionals in the field, uh, teachers, other uh, professionals, you name it, um, to support community systems and different service providers, evaluation. Uh, uh, much of what I uh, do day to day uh, revolves around research and information dissemination. So um, really, you know, we, I, I see my role here and, and a lot of what DDI does as a connector. I mean, we connect people to various resources, try to find information for folks. Uh, and, and much of what I've done, uh, like I said, in recent years is uh, try to connect parents uh, and students with disabilities uh, to different post-secondary options. So I'll go about and explain what post-secondary education is and what it entails, um, why it's beneficial, uh, for not only for students with disabilities, but for all students. Um, also discuss uh, some different uh, issues facing families and students with disabilities as they exit uh, the secondary system or high school and you know really start to look at the options after high school um, you know employment options uh, post-secondary or college options uh, and, and really s try to provide a picture of what's going on what it looks like for different students in different situations um, and also uh, you know what it what is going to happen in the future what, what we can do to help make more opportunities available uh, so that folks have, you know, more than one option, more than two options. We want to make as many options, uh, put as many options on the table as possible uh, for students and families. Um, but as I get started here, I'm going to try to do another poll like we did last week. So uh, I will put this out there right now and ask you, do you believe is college college-level education, an option for students with developmental and intellectual disabilities, just from your own experiences. Uh, much of what I'm going to put out here today and discuss has to do with, um, you know, whether or not we believe this is a viable option. Okay, so if that pops up on your screen, if you could go ahead and answer it. 100% yes, 96% yes. Well, that's good. I like to see that. Um, you know, I, many of you work in different areas, uh, in social work, in education, uh, in healthcare, in community health, mental health. Um, so this is going to look different to many of you. Uh, if you're family members, if you're students, if you're individuals with disabilities, you know, your, your definition of higher education and uh, your belief in who can access it, okay, who can take advantage of higher education, and who it will benefit, I think, is shaped a lot by our experiences, as always. Um, but I really want to, to uh, uh, really impress upon you that college is an option for everyone. Okay, um, there are many of us who who need uh, much more support to be successful, but that support is out there. It's a matter of uh, identifying what's needed, identifying you know a student's goals. Um, and, and really pinpointing on that goal and working towards it. Um, it's not easy. Uh, and, and the big thing here to, to keep in mind is that there's not only there's not ever only one solution to this or one path to take. Uh, that's one, actually one of the, the more difficult things with post-secondary education is that there, there, there is no direct path in a lot of cases, uh, whether or not a student has a disability. So uh, it really throws a wrench in a lot of uh, a lot of people's plans, but there are ways to work around it. There's ways to work through it, uh, and we'll talk. We'll discuss those today. So thank you. So 93% of you think that uh, this is an option for folks. That's good to see. Good to hear. Okay. So just a little bit of definition as we start out here. So what is post-secondary ed, or as I'll call it, I'll, I'll use the acronym today, PSE. Um, 
you know, I've talked to a lot of folks about this. Uh, and it, there seems to be some confusion here and there, um, but it's because it's a very broad term. So essentially what post-secondary ed refers to, or PSE, is third level education, higher education. So it's non-compulsory, okay? So you can take courses uh, from, from other departments. You can explore uh, different careers. Uh, you take courses on your time. Uh, many departments and colleges have restrictions on how long it should take you to complete a degree. Um, but in the end, you know, you can take the time you need to work towards uh, your certificate, towards your degree, uh, towards whatever credential you're working towards. It's non-compulsory. Uh, it's the level following high school. Okay, so this can this can look like many different things. Um, this can include college participation, your traditional two-year community college, four-year college or university. Um, this can also include on-campus programs. Okay, uh, technical and business schools such as ITT, Walsh College. Okay, different um, specialty schools. These are included in that definition. Oh, and as we go on, if you have any questions, of course, you can type them into the chat box. Uh, I'll pause throughout here to, to address questions that pop up. Um, so just put them in there anytime you have one. Let's go back one here. So why is this important to talk about? Um, well, it's important for everyone in that Participation in, in PSC is clearly beneficial. Okay, it leads to higher lifetime earnings, uh, broader career options. Okay, we can test out our likes, our dislikes in, in a post-secondary program or in, in college. Okay, uh, it builds our social networks. It has a, a it has an impact on our independence, uh, on our ability to to uh, you know positive positively interact with with other people meeting new people, more exposure to internships, employment opportunities. Um, and in, in the case of, of folks who rely on uh, uh, or depend upon public assistance or funding at some level, um, this can help reduce that dependence and make us more independent, uh, able to earn a, uh, higher wages, for example. Okay. So what we also know is that the absence of this post-secondary experience or, or a degree really can hinder our ability to live on our own. It can hinder our ability to earn a livable wage, um, to, to have a broad social network, to build on that social capital that's so important to having a happy life. Okay, So it, it works on many levels. Um, so just a little bit of research here. So this study, the data here, this table depicts the impact that any exposure to PSE uh, training and opportunities has upon our eventual you know, paid employment and our earnings. Um, this study was done in 2009. Uh, it's data from a national vocational rehabilitation database uh, where they looked at uh, youth with intellectual disabilities um, who are exiting vocational rehab and they looked at whether or not those individuals had any sort of post secondary ed or you know, PSC experience while they were in voc rehab and what impact that had on their ability to gain paid employment after they left voc rehab uh, and this is a national study so what we find is that around 32 percent of those that had no PSC which is the largest portion of this group so out of the 30 a little over 36,000 individuals who were in, who, whose data was in the study um, around almost 35,000, 34,931 um, did not report having any sort of PSE experience while in voc rehab. Um, of that 34,000 and change, 11,261 uh, gained paid employment after they left. Uh, that's about 32% for an average of about $195 a week. Now, we look at those who had some PSE experiences, perhaps they took a course, they were part of some uh, training program, so on and so forth, um, you know, which the numbers dropped down. So you had about 1,200 folks report some experiences. But of that group, uh, around 48% gained paid employment for an average uh, weekly income of $316. So there's a, there's a big jump there just from some experience. And then of the, the, the last ones were those who completed a PSE program, earned some credential or degree while participating in vocational rehabilitation. Um, and 58% went on to gain paid employment. 
uh, with $338 a week. So we can see the impact here. Um, but again, you know, this is a research study. Uh, there, there are other things I'd like to look at in this data if I were questioning it. Um, I'd like to compare it to folks with other disabilities and see what the impact is as well. But just on the surface, we can see, and this, this pie chart depicts it a little more concretely here, um, the impact that, that the, the, their experiences in a post-secondary ed program or college or school had on their ability to gain paid employment. Okay, their level of earnings and so forth. Just a little bit of data for you here. Um, again, in going further, why is this important down the road? Why is it important that we uh, have these PSC experiences, that we can have the option to go on and work towards a degree or a credential? Um, well, in a report put up by the state of Michigan, by, by about 2018, new Michigan jobs requiring post-secondary education uh, it's projected to grow by roughly 116,000. So 116,000 new jobs that will require people to have uh, uh, some post-secondary educational degree or experience. Okay. Uh, in contrast, new jobs not requiring PSC experience are only projected to grow by about 22,000. All right. Um, so of all Michigan jobs, about 62% will require some. PSC experiences by 2018. These are all new, the new jobs that are projected to be, uh, be created in that time. Okay, so there's going to be a significant increase in competition for new employment over the next five years or so. Uh, college degree will be all but essential. It's it's really going to differentiate folks. Okay, um, so there's a growing need, obviously, to successfully complete programs, but also to gain the other experiences from PSC. Okay, so those social experiences, that exposure to, like we talked, like I mentioned, internships, uh, you know, paid and unpaid, uh, different employment opportunities, social networking, and so on. So there's a lot more to the experience than simply the, you know, the terminal degree. Um, that's why we we see an impact, even with just some post secondary educational experience. So. I, I kind of split this up to look at uh, two different populations of college students with disabilities, okay, or potential college students. So we have uh, those students with a high school diploma. So those uh, students with disabilities who, who graduate from college, who earn a high school diploma, um, and can then enter college or apply to college through those traditional routes, okay. And we also have students who We'll, we'll get through high school without a diploma, with that certificate of completion. Okay. Um, now we know that without a high school diploma, anyone without a high school diploma drastically limits, in this case, your college options, your PSC options. Okay. So we'll I'll talk about how this looks for both of these groups of students. <coughs> Pardon me. So the first group here, these are students that I that I work with. Um, uh, most often, most closely, um, as Elizabeth mentioned, we have a learning community here at Wayne State. Well, we have a learning community program, very large learning community program. Um, if you're unfamiliar with learning communities, they are smaller groups of students um, that may be taking the same course that might be in the same department. Um, they all look very different, but they all are based on a peer mentor model. So you have uh, a student who is you know, upper level student, junior, senior, graduate student. Um, who works with the group, uh, with the learning community and, and the newer students to give them insight to help them answer, you know, to answer questions, to show them around campus and so on and so forth. Um, so in 2012, we, we uh, applied and were, were uh, granted an opportunity to form a learning community for students with disabilities. Uh, so I work with uh, uh, our campus student disability service office uh, Randy Crewman, who's the director over there, and all her folks, and we really try to uh, provide students with just an extra layer of support, uh, another place to go to ask questions, um, you know, really try to bring them information and opportunities on campus. And we also collaborate with the, uh, an AmeriCorps project here on campus, the uh, Urban Safety Project. Um, so we've been able to take part in some of their um, community activities. So just trying to give students, uh, 
you know, access to different opportunities and information that they might not have access to. And also, you know, we, we really try to keep it, uh, it's peer mentorship, but we try to keep it as self-determined as possible. So we really let the students decide, you know, what we're going to do, the questions. We do try to do a lot of social activities, visit the museum and so forth in Midtown here. Um, so through that work, I've been able to work with students who have graduated high school with a diploma who make it to campus, okay? And nationally, we're looking at about 11%. I, I think, that, you know, that data is from about, I think, 2010, 2011. It's no doubt higher. Probably we can look at it about 11 to 15% of current U.S. college students uh, report some disability, okay? Uh, we see a higher rate of this at community colleges. And what does that do? Well, it increases the diversity of learning styles in the classroom, of course. Um, back in, I call it back in the olden times, in my training in psychology, you know, for a long time, behaviorism ruled. So, in, in behaviorists, you know, disregarded, uh, for, for the most part, disregarded things like learning styles and, and uh, cognition. And really, what they did was set up, you know, through any set of parameters, in the environment, we can produce learning, okay? Well, through a lot of research over the years, we know that that's not necessarily the case, okay? Uh, students learn at different paces. Students learn through different activities. Um, they learn very differently from their peers in a lot of cases. And when we have students who have, for example, learning disabilities or students who have, uh, uh, students who might be on the autism spectrum, okay? There are different things that we can do to help all the students in the classroom learn uh, and provide, uh, you know, through, for example, through universal design for learning, we can provide options for students that will help them access information easier uh, and perhaps make it more meaningful to them. And I'll, I'll discuss um, universal design a little bit at the end today as well. Um, so just getting back to uh, what does it look like for students with disabilities on campus? So um, there is a growing need to engage these students. Okay, and why? Well, about 50% of the students with disabilities who enroll in higher education do not graduate. It's a pretty solid number, around, it's 50-50 at this point, compared to the graduation rates of college students without disabilities, which is around 89%. So there's a big disparity there. Um, and, and just looking back a little bit, so why do we see this, this jump in enrollment? Well, um, through, uh, if you're familiar with the National Longitudinal Transition Study, the NLTS, been going on for a long time, uh, looking at different characteristics of students and student success. They look at disabilities as well. Um, so the number of students completing high school from 1987 to 2003, the number of students with disabilities completing high school rose by 17%. This led to a, 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 an equally large jump in the rise of enrollment of these students in post-secondary settings. Okay, so now we have all these students that are coming out of uh, secondary education, they're coming out of special education, and they're going on to a college campus. Okay? And we're finding that they're just not succeeding at the rate, the same rate, or even at close to the same rate as their peers who do not report disabilities. Okay, so why? We start looking at why. There, there, there's no really one single answer here. Okay. Um, there, there's a lot of different answers. Uh, it, uh, you know, there are many things that pertain to both students with and without disabilities. Uh, trouble with financial aid. Um, trouble with, uh, you know, completing courses and so on and so forth. You know, any student can have difficulties in these areas. We want to know, but we want to look at specifically, you know, students who have disabilities. Why are they not finding success at the same rate? So, um, we look at transition. So we, we find that a lot of students are just not fully prepared to transition to a college campus. Um, and of course, people ask, well, whose fault is it? Well, it's really not one person's fault. It's, it's, uh, uh, there, there's a myriad of things, as you know, if you work in uh, high schools, you work as a transition coordinator in an intermediate school district, you know, there's a lot of students uh, who are looking to transition from from a special education setting to college, um, what do we do? Okay, uh, we'll, we'll look at a few things that have been done, a few uh, of the best practices around uh, preparing students to transition uh, towards college. Um, you know, classically, we've had lower expectations for students. Students have not been told that they're going to be able to go to college. Okay, 
Sometimes it's as simple as planting the seed. Um, students are uncertain about the role in the accommodation process in higher education. It looks very different than it did in uh, high school. Okay, um, Underdeveloped self-advocacy skills. A lot of students don't know how to go out and ask these questions. They're, they're, they're not shown how, they're not told that they're able to do this. Okay. Um, this isn't all students. Keep in mind, please. This is we're looking at the students who who do fall by the wayside. We, 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 we ident we've identified some factors that might be at play here. Uh, this comes from all, all many different kinds of studies. Um, so like lack of information regarding what supports are available to them on a college campus or in a PSE program. And you know, at bottom line is fear of the unknown. Uh, many students uh, who have disabilities, they just they don't know what's available. Okay, and again, this is one of those factors that can that crosses over, regardless of disability. Students, you know, looking at students who don't finish college or don't complete a, a, a PSE program, they they just weren't prepared, and they get there and they don't know what to expect. They don't know who to talk to a lot of times. Okay, so one of the big things, uh, so for example, there's programs like Gear Up that are that that form partnerships between. Uh, high schools and colleges, and they bring the students to college. They bring them to campus. They show them the admissions office. They show them the student unions. You know, it goes a long way in taking the fear out, and it also goes a long way in showing the students, well, this is where things are. You know, if you have a question about your classes, you go here. If you have a question about uh, uh, registering with your student disability service office and getting accommodations for your courses, you go here. Okay. So by taking the fear out, I think it goes a long way in you know giving that confidence to students and really showing them that hey, you can do this on your own. You can ask for these things; they're guaranteed to you. Okay. Um, there's other programs like the Delta Project, whom I've worked with over the years. Uh, I'll go back up here. Um, the Delta Project is is a project uh, or a partnership between. Uh, Saginaw Intermediate School District at Delta College, um, and it, it's, a, it's a very structured program. Students uh, who are in special education with disabilities can apply to be part of it uh, during their uh, sophomore years at Delta College, and it gives them again these experiences of, you know, writing an essay, uh, writing a college, taking a college entrance exam. Um, uh, you know, it goes beyond just just uh, uh, preparing for the ACT. It goes to campus. They do mock admissions and so on and so forth. So these are just some of the things that are going on and, and I'm sure there are, there are other programs around the state in your areas uh, that are doing a lot of these same things and they go a long way in helping prepare students to make that jump uh, and, and, to, and to not make it blindly. So one of the other things that, uh, and just in talking with parents uh, over the years, um, you know, one of the other things is, is what is the difference? What is the difference going from secondary ed, from high school to college, as far as the supports and services that are available for students uh, with various disabilities? Um, so, if you're, most of you are probably familiar with this. Uh, some who aren't, I'll explain a, a little. Uh, in in K-12 in Michigan, K-12 students with disabilities who are in special education have IEPs, which is your individualized education plan or ed individual uh, education uh, program. They go by a couple different names. Um, th this is where uh, student and their circle of support, their families, um, anybody they choose to be in that circle, they meet, they identify, this, you know, the student identifies their goals. And then they talk about what they have to do to get there. So it's very structured. Um, and the, the school has to honor these. Um, so they guarantee services and supports for students. Now, the student transitions from this to uh, a college campus where there are guaranteed supports by law. Okay, uh, We talk about Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act. We talk about the Higher Education Opportunity Act. There are laws in place, students with disabilities, uh, are guaranteed certain accommodations, okay? But the big difference here is student has to go out and get those, okay? You have to self-identify, which is a big barrier with many students. Um, students coming out of, of secondary and going to college, uh, especially students who might have hidden disabilities, um, 
may not want to self-identify. They, they perhaps they, you know, they feel a, a stigma. They, they may have had bad experiences growing up, and they don't want to repeat those. Okay, very understandable. Um, however, you ha in order to get accommodations. For example, at Wayne State, you have to go to Student Disability Services. You have to present them with some documentation that you do have a recognized disability. Um, and once you do that, then you work with the counselors there and they work with faculty and uh, those uh, the instructors of your courses. And you work out what kind of accommodations you need, whether it's note takers, um, whether it's uh, you know audio versions or e-versions of a book or textbook, um, you name it. We'll, and we'll discuss a couple with uh, types of accommodations, um, but it's a it's it's a change from where the students coming from, okay, um, and in a lot of ways, the college faculty, uh, staff, people working on campus are looked at to fill the gap left by this transition, um, but but the biggest filler of this gap is the student themselves, uh, and, and and really understanding their role is another can be another obstacle, but it's another opportunity to show students. Um, you know, this is what you need to do uh, if you need certain accommodations in, uh, in your courses. Um, and this, this is just, a, I'm showing a, a form here, um, of some documentation I found through Macomb Community College's website, uh, just kind of outlining the differences between secondary education and post-secondary education as it pertains to uh, federal laws around uh, students with disabilities in education. Um, what you're eligible for, what documentation you need. So the big one here is in secondary ed in high school, uh, K to 12, school districts are responsible for providing trained personnel to assess eligibility and plan educational services. And then when you go to post-secondary education, the students are responsible for obtaining disability documentation from a professional who is qualified to assess uh, uh, their particular disability. And then the students are also responsible for telling disability services staff that they have a disability, uh, that they want to request accommodations. Okay, accommodations are provided so students with disabilities can access the educational programs, the courses, um, different uh, uh, services on campus um, that are used by all other students. So it's not, you know, a lot of times we run into resistance with faculty who. who don't want to accommodate. Well, first we have to understand, you know, it is the law. However, they do have a little bit of latitude as to how accommodations are provided, okay? And I think it's important for anyone working in higher education to understand that accommodations are not tipping the board in favor of a group of students, okay? It's, it's a matter of leveling that playing field and really making the course accessible to students who might learn a different way, who might uh, access information in a different way, okay? So it's, it's not favoritism, right? This is simply a, a leveling of the playing field so that the student has an equal chance at success as their peers in the course, okay? So a couple of, couple of examples. I mentioned the Delta Project. There's just some things that are being done uh, in Michigan right now um, to, to engage students on campus, engage students with disabilities to uh, provide uh, structure during that time of transition uh, and to make more information available to students so they can make informed decisions as they uh, transition across that gap. Um, so the Delta Project is a partnership between the Second ISD, uh, Intermediate School District, and uh, Delta College, Community College in Saginaw, in, in, the, in the region there at in University Center. Um, so they're eligible, their sophomore students are eligible sophomore year, they have to apply to this. Um, they have to write an essay and, you know, uh, get the, the staff to understand what their goals are, okay? So it's not, not everyone gets into this program, okay? I think that's a big, a big thing to understand, okay? So this serves students uh, who um, have, uh, I guess, who are college-minded, already. Um, however, I, uh, in, in talking to the director of the program, you know, there's been students they've, they've had in the program who, who didn't want to go to college, however, applied, got in. Um, and so it really helped them to perhaps look at college options that they may not have been entertaining. OK. 
okay? So they go, they do mock applications, campus visits, they do transportation training in the region. So students use public transit, they know how to use it to get to Delta College, for example. Um, promotes thinking about their future, employment, um, what they want to do for a living, and so on and so forth. And again, it's taking the mystery out of that process. Um, let me see here if I have this link working. Um, so if it comes up, eh, if it comes up, it comes up. Um, so it's just a nice program that is really giving students an extra level of support, an extra level of structure um, as they look to transition. Okay. Um, so what else is being done? You know, actively engaging students with disabilities on campus is key. Um, faculty, staff, uh, peers, um, you know, I, I mentioned the learning community and that I, the number one goal is really to engage students, to get them involved in their education, to get them uh, involved in their own success and invested in it. So, you know, one thing I do, another thing I do on campus here is work with faculty um, to, to really address their concerns. So, you know, one would think all faculty know about all the services on campus, and that's simply not true, especially at a larger university, uh, a larger college or university like Wayne State. You know, many faculty are like, well, I don't know, I've never had to accommodate a student with a disability before. Um, so I try to work with them to, you know, we got to take the mystery out of it for them as well. Um, so how do you actively engage students with disabilities? Well, ask questions. You know, if a student approaches you as, as a faculty or staff member, um, you know, know where the disability service office is, know where uh, different resources are on campus that you can connect them with, and then work with the student to, to really get at what is it that would help them be successful in your course. Okay, that's just another another side of this engagement. Um, you know, student retention, student engagement is a very big issue on on, on any college campus, um, and and really, in just in the last couple of years, it's be finally becoming uh, students with disabilities are finally becoming part of that conversation as far as um, engaging students and really uh, providing the services they need, but also uh, forming forming these relationships. You know, uh, it's going to help not only the students and the faculty, but it's also going to help students down the road because the faculty and the staff will be more informed uh, and, and better able to, to provide uh, or answer the questions that students bring up. Um, and, and again, just building awareness of the needs of, of, of different types of learners and, and looking at learning uh, as a form of diversity. Okay, I mentioned universal design. I'm going to discuss that at the, at the tail end here today. Um, you know, really having an understanding of the existing accommodation procedures, what resources are available. Okay, um, so providing training and resources for faculty and staff is a big is a big deal. Uh, we see this growing on, like I said, growing on different college campuses. Uh, there are major efforts underway here at Wayne State um, to develop and put together a, a pretty comprehensive training. Um, for faculty and staff that will walk them through this process and, and empower them to, to be confident in, in providing accommodations. Just looking here quickly, any questions? I don't see any questions yet, so I'll keep going. <clears throat> and again, you know, instructors, college staff, uh, other people on campus that work on campus, um, you know, they have a big role in, in, in connecting students. They have their, they, they should have the knowledge of campus resources. Um, you know, they're usually that first point of contact for students, especially instructors. Um, it's, it's, so it's vital that they have the information available, that they have a working knowledge of, uh, uh, you know, how they would go about uh, connecting a student with a disability to a, a resource, to the disability service office, and so on. Um, in, in, in every course, in every syllabus uh, or course guide I've ever seen, uh, you will see invariably a, a small paragraph at the end that states, if you have a disability, call this number. Okay? Um, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer, in, again, in this engagement process and really explaining that the first day uh, and, and making it known and making students feel comfortable in asking questions. Uh, you know, if they have a disability, yes, you can call that number, but you can also talk to me. I'm an instructor. 
uh, let's work out how we could make you all successful in this course, okay? Um, so it's just, again, going, I guess, going that extra mile, but I don't, I don't see it necessarily as an extra mile. I see that as an essential part of, a, of the process of engaging all students. Um, and if we're, you know, we're truly looking to have college courses and different PSD programs, uh, if we truly want them to be inclusive, um, then we need to provide these services for all students. We need to engage all students, okay? Um, and, and another thing I also I try to emphasize is that diversity in the classroom has a positive impact on everyone, all right? Um, it can lead to uh, creative ways of, of looking at material, creative ways for the instructor of assessing student success. It doesn't always have to be a multiple choice exam or an essay exam. You can have different ways to assess uh, a student's understanding of material and, and having students who, for example, might have a learning disability or might uh, um, you know, be blind or, or low vision in a classroom and how they access information can help other students in the, in the classroom and help the instructors also look at that information in perhaps a different light or a different way and, and you know, lead to a more accessible course down the road. Okay. I've seen it have this impact. Uh, it's just a matter of really um, explaining how that impact works. Um, so I, I mentioned earlier just different types of academic, academic adjustments and accommodations. So what do they look like? Uh, what, what things are available for students? And, and there are a myriad of, of, of different things from assistive technology. Um, you know, most uh, student disability service offices have uh, assistive technology available that students can use, um, you know, from screen readers uh, to audio re recording equipment to e-text e versions, e-textbooks, and so on. Um, uh, the students can also request extended exam time, quiet testing spaces, tape recordings, okay? Uh, I've seen some pretty creative uh, accommodations when, when the student and an instructor and a disability service office all work together to address uh, an issue the student's having. And, and, and that, that kind of collaboration, I think, is very important, uh, especially on a college campus where I, I feel a lot of times, uh, especially faculty who have been around a long time, uh, tend to get in a mode, right, uh, using the same presentations and so on that they've used for years. Perhaps the information's fine, but perhaps the delivery could be tweaked or changed to make the information more accessible. Just an example, a couple examples just for everybody. I, because I get that question a lot, what, is, what does an accommodation look like at the college level? Okay. Um, okay, so moving on, we just discussed the students who make it to campus, who are on campus, who are graduating with a diploma, with a high school diploma, applying to maybe perhaps getting into a college or university to uh, another PSC training program perhaps. Um, but we also know that there are many students uh, who do not earn a, a high school diploma for you know many different reasons, um, and the picture is very different for them. So, in the case of earning, for example, a certificate of completion versus a high school diploma, um, you know, in Michigan, students can remain in special education programs until age 26. Um, but what students are doing in these programs is very it varies widely across the state. Um, you know, there, there are some, some uh, programs at, at various intermediate school districts that are going a long way to preparing these students uh, who remain in the programs in, until a later age, um, you know, for employment. Um, there, 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 there are some programs that have an academic focus. Um, however, there's no real um, system here. Uh, I've, I've talked to parents from around the state. I've talked to various administrators around the state um, and, and you know many programs vary from being uh, akin to a sheltered workshop which is something uh, to a segregated setting uh, which we know is not beneficial for the widest range of individuals um, but then we've seen programs that are very thoughtful uh, that are that are providing uh, very self-determined person-centered uh, uh, different types of activities for the students okay um, so it, it makes it really difficult to, you know, to find a direction here. Um, so we really must determine the best fit for a student. 
keep it self-determined, keep it person-centered. You know, parents, members of the student circle of support, um, really need to weigh all the options. Look, you know, take some, take some time, reflect, thoughtful planning, consideration. A lot easier said than done, all right? Um, but really look at the students' wants, their needs, their goals, right? Their abilities, uh, what they've been studying, what they've been doing, how that's going to lead to their future. Uh, and then, of course, look at all the options beyond that, okay? Um, so re there's really no, again, no single answer here. Uh, there's no, you know, one magic pill solution. We know that. Uh, and I think that's what makes this, you know, kind of a, a really difficult time for a lot of families. Um, we don't know uh, a lot of times what our options are. Um, so what are we looking at? So students with disabilities uh, graduating without a high school diploma. Um, or I'm sorry, graduating with a high school diploma have options that those without a diploma just don't get to enjoy. So access to a financial aid, your traditional college admission process, um, access to other grants and scholarships, uh, qualify for other educational supports and programs. Um, so the certificate of completion, and get, I get that question a lot from, from parents especially, um, you know, what does it mean? Well, to most, to the vast majority of colleges and, and post-secondary educational uh, programs and, and, and institutes of higher learning, they don't recognize it, okay? Um, you know, I've been told that there are, are a couple community colleges in the state who will allow students with a certificate to apply to test and, and see if they are uh, able to, uh, to go to the community college. Um, I don't know if that's 100% true, and I really don't want to put them out there until I can really, you know, contact these institutions and, or these colleges and, and really find out for sure. But it's, it's definitely not the norm. It's not common practice. Um, there was a, a, a program through the federal financial aid called Ability to Benefit Option, um, where students without a high school diploma, if they could uh, show that they would have the ability to benefit from post-secondary education, that they would then be eligible for uh, federal financial aid. Unfortunately, that, that program was uh, canceled in 2012. Um, so again, it, it, not having that high school diploma really does limit um, your post-secondary options, okay? So, <clears throat> pardon me. Um, what are some other avenues to explore? Well, for example, uh, we talk about inclusive PSE programs. Now, what are they? Um, they're inclusive campus-based programs, okay, primarily for students with intellectual develop or developmental disabilities. Um, they're, they include an academic focus, okay, so students can take courses, uh, a lot of times for credit. Um, also, they can uh, take courses, audit courses, uh, where it wouldn't be for credit, uh, but students are able to pick and take and, and, and participate in courses um, along with their peers. There's both natural and structured supports in these programs. Um, they're very outcome-based, okay, and very employment-minded. employment, employment minded. So, uh, you know, there are target goals for each student in these, in, in, in an inclusive PSE program, um, you know, based on their wants and their, and their goals. So if, if a student comes in and says, I really want to, um, you know, help design websites, for example, well, Many of the in inclusive programs will work with the student to identify courses they can take, uh, perhaps you know, connect them with folks in the uh, computer science department to talk to. Uh, we'll look at possible internships and so on and so forth. Um, you know, there are programs that also have a residential component where students uh, can live on campus in a lot of ways, uh, in, in a lot of cases. Um, and the, there is a cost with the majority of these uh, that, that varies from college to college. Um, a lot of times there are opportunities for families to, to apply for grants, um, to apply for different funding. Um, in, in some programs uh, on the East Coast, uh, students are able to use uh, their, diff their various state funding that they receive um, uh, through such things as Social Security, Medicaid, to, to help assuage the cost. Again, that's not, to my understanding, that's, that is not the norm, but uh, there are a couple programs that exist. Um, so the real genesis behind many of these inclusive college 
uh, inclusive PSC programs came out of Think College. Many of you, I'm sure, are, are familiar with Think College. Uh, it's it's at the, uh, worked it works out of the uh, Institute of Community Inclusion at University of Massachusetts Boston. That would be uh, DDI's uh, counterpart. That's the University Center for Excellence in Disabilities in Massachusetts. Um, and Think College grew out of a federal grant that helped to establish 27 post-secondary educational programs uh, at various colleges around the country. Um, and these are, you know, really looked at as demonstration projects. So uh, they're testing various models, okay? So what does, you know, a question I get a lot is, what does a PSC program look like? Well, they look very different depending on where you go. It depends on the college. Um, a lot depends on the state that it's in uh, and the region. Um, you know, it, it really is a matter of who's involved in, in creating these programs, who's involved in administrating them, um, you know, what resources exist at the, at the college where, it's, where the program is, uh, uh, and, and just, you know, a lot of different factors go into this. So right now, uh, these programs are testing what works, what doesn't. Um, you know, most of the outcomes that are being looked at with these 27 programs, they're looking at employment outcomes. So are students who are involved in these PSC programs, are they gaining employment while they're there? Are they gaining employment once they leave, uh, once they complete the program? Um, they're looking at quality of life. You know, are, are the students more independent? Are they able to self-advocate more? How, are their circles of support, their, their social networks growing? Okay, all of those factors we discussed earlier that are beneficial from participating in a in a post secondary setting at a college and a program um, are being looked at through this and uh, these twenty seven programs. Uh, some do, like I mentioned, have a residential option where students are living on campus. Okay, um, I'm just going to show their website here really quick. Is this is this again? This is a uh, um, one of the uh, number one resources that, I, that I, I, I tend to pass along to parents. So the Think College website, and just looking ahead a little bit, as part of the um, activity at the end of this presentation today, at the end of the webinar today, I'm going to have you go on this website and try to search for a couple programs, okay? So they have a lot of resources here, uh, different publications and whatnot, but they have a section where you can search the country for different PSC programs. Now think college, these are, they are, their goal is to develop college options for people with intellectual disabilities, okay? So these are all programs, and when you search through those programs, those are all programs for, for individuals with intellectual disabilities, okay? Just to be clear on that. Uh, one example, uh, uh, a colleague of mine uh, runs a program called ACIT in College, A-C-E-I-T in College. It's at Virginia Commonwealth University, and they're one of these 27 programs that was started. Uh, it's individualized, it's inclusive. Uh, mm -hmm. Students are part of a 30-month on-campus experience. Um, they, in, this, in this project, in ACIT, they work towards the completion of a credential. There was an existing uh, College of Education uh, certificate there, a credential, um, that they were able to hook up with and so the students in this program have to earn or complete 18 to 21 credits while they're there in those 30 months uh, and these are core service learning courses um, you know there are elective courses that the students can choose to take themselves as well uh, but like any other college student who's working towards a certain degree there are certain courses you have to complete in order to get there and there's different uh, uh, electives you can take along the way. So it's set up, it, it's exactly, it's very, as any other college student would go towards this particular certificate. Um, uh, they gain work experiences through through ACIP. Um, the classes are based on individual career life paths, so it's very person-centered. Um, students who enter the program can have or not have a high school diploma, or in this case they can still be in high school. Okay, so students who are still in high school who have intellectual disabilities who uh, can qualify, can, can get into the program here, uh, can participate as well. And for ACIT, employment is, is their priority. They're really trying to prepare students uh, to be employable uh, and employable in the careers, uh, in the line of work that the students identify as 
their goal. Okay, so that's just one example. Um, again, you know these these inclusive programs look very different from college to college uh, and from state to state. Um, we're, we're starting to see some data, some findings coming out of these programs. Um, it's only been going on for about two years with these in particular. Uh, now these, just uh, kind of a caveat here, these are not the only, there aren't only these 27 uh, inclusive post-secondary educational programs, okay? There are more around the country. You gotta get out and search for them. You can use the Think College website. Um, but it's again, one of those, one of the hard parts of, of really finding a fit is you've got to go out and look. You really have to do the footwork, do the research. If, if uh, you're an individual with disabilities, if you're a family member, a parent, um, finding the right fit I, I think is very important, of course. Um, you know, many students try out different colleges and they're not for them, so they go, for example, they might start out at a Michigan State, find out, I, you know, a big university like this isn't for me, and then go to, you know, like, Bay Community College and find out that's a much better fit. It's the same thing for PSC programs, okay? Uh, it's really a matter of doing the work and, and, and finding these programs. Um, uh, so just, just to say that to, to show you that some of the findings from these 27 programs uh, in two years now, they're entering their third year, um, so there should be a lot more data coming out. Um, but students enrolled, uh, students with, that, with intellectual disabilities uh, have enrolled in, in the two years of these program, these these PSC programs, have enrolled in over 4,800 different courses. Okay, uh, around 58% are enrolled uh, enrolled in courses for standard university credit, meaning they were earning the credit for the courses they were enrolled in. Uh, in this case, the other uh, the other 42% were likely auditing the courses, okay? They weren't earning the credit, but they were getting the experience in the courses uh, and doing the work and, and gaining that valuable uh, experience of, of being in a college course and completing a college course. Um, many of the students in these programs have been involved in career development activities, around 36% of them. Uh, and again, this is gonna vary not only by program, but uh, by the students' wants and desires, okay? Um, employment data, uh, post-participation is being collected right now. Um, many of the students in these programs hold paying jobs while they are enrolled, while they are in the PSC program. Just as any other college student might have a, a, a job on campus, a work-study job, or work in the community, you know, at a restaurant. I pretty much put myself through college by working restaurant jobs in the town of where I went. Um, and so we're really waiting to see what uh, the, the employment data is going to show for these students who are exiting these programs now in the next couple of years. So it brings us back to Michigan. So what options do we have here? Um, not a lot, unfortunately. Uh, there are some. We do have some PSC options here. Um, and I'm sure there's others uh, around the state that I've not heard of yet. Uh, again, Michigan's a big state. Um, there are things going on in different pockets of the state that uh, myself or you may not have uh, found yet. Um, but that's one, one of my missions is to really, you know, search out what's good, search out what's going on around the state uh, in the line of post-secondary education uh, and, and programs and options for students. Um, one, one example uh, that uh, is going on in Washtenaw County is uh, collaboration between the Washington Intermediate School District and Eastern Michigan University. Uh, John Rose over there has done a wonderful job. He's, uh, they, they formed this partnership back in the late 90s, in fact, uh, and students who are part of uh, Washington ISD were in special education um, that, that are, you know, might remain there until they're 26. They uh, have these opportunities to participate in college courses on campus at Eastern. Um, there's a couple students in the program right now who are living on campus um, and, you know, some that are, have worked with uh, sports teams on campus and then different internships that may turn into, one in particular, looks like it's turning into a full-time paid position uh, once he exits the, uh, the Washington ISD program. So that's, that's one example. Um, there's also uh, Ready for Life at Hope College in Holland, Michigan. Um, and I'm sure many of you are very familiar with that program. That is an on-campus program 
for students with intellectual disabilities. Um, get to my notes here. Uh, you know, they offer the on-campus experience. It's not free. There is a cost involved, which, you know, there's a, a cost involved with, with most post-secondary programs out there um, in other states as well. Um, you know, students do not take courses for credit in Ready for Life. If I'm wrong, please correct me, but as far as I understand, um, they, they, I believe they can audit courses, um, but there's a lot of peer support that goes on. Uh, they have many different programs and, and wonderful opportunities throughout the year for the students as well. So that's another, just another example. Um, one other one here is also Northook Academy. Northook is at Grand Rapids Community College. This is a program for adults with, with developmental and intellectual disabilities. Um, there's, there's a very small cost involved with Northwood, but the students uh, take courses and, and work towards a college credential. Okay? Um, it, it's just another one of those programs that's actually been around for a very long time. Uh, it was started uh, uh, through uh, donations that were made, uh, I, I want to say in the late 80s, uh, early 90s, and it's been going on ever since. So it's, it's a nice option for students who live in and around the Grand Rapids area. Um, but other than that, you know, there, there, there are a lot of development activities going on in different counties right now, um, you know, and we're really working hard towards establishing more PSE options, uh, inclusive programs on campus, um, you know, greater awareness and engagement of students who are on college campuses already uh, by faculty and staff and, and, and other folks on campus. And we just really want to increase the recognition of the need for these PSE options, you know. Um, many families get to the point of transition and they just, they, you know, I, I hear it we weekly. They just, they don't know where to turn. They don't know what is out there beyond high school, um, beyond special education. They don't know what's available for their students in the form of education. And, you know, students that want to continue their education aren't sure where to go, okay? Uh, are there any questions before I move on here? Look. Okay, don't see me right now, but I'll, I'll check back on that in a little bit. Um, so I have one other poll here that I'll throw out there. Um, so is, is post-secondary education an option for adults with developmental and intellectual disabilities? So traditionally, we think of students exiting high school. Okay. But, you know, I, I'm a firm believer in, the, in, in that education never stops. Um, you know, I take courses myself still to this day here on campus uh, to try to learn more about different topics. So, you know, do you believe that education is an option for adults? Let's, for example, if you have, uh, uh, you know, a, an individual uh, maybe has a roommate or two who has developmental disabilities who needs around the clock care, is post-secondary education an option? for that person. I believe it is. I think the resources are out there. It's a matter of exploring them. Uh, it's a matter of finding a fit for everyone. Uh, one of the tools that, uh, that I see a lot of promise in, that uh, many people see a lot of promise in, is the use of something called universal design. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with this, um, although it's, 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 it seems to be a, a more of an emerging concept, an emerging idea. Uh, in post-secondary education. Uh, I've seen it probably used more in secondary ed, in, in, in high school classroom. Um, let me close this here. Um, okay, let me get this show the screen here again. Okay, there we go. Um, so what is universal design? Well, it's, it's the design of products, environments, uh, uh, lectures, uh, course materials. This can, this can go beyond education. It actually started uh, more in, in the field of engineering and product design. How do we make products? How do we make uh, buildings? How do we make anything, cars, more usable, more accessible? How can we make, make them, you know, better 
for a wider range of individuals and abilities. Okay, so it's really the goal is to make things more usable and accessible to the greatest extent possible, so that later on, perhaps we do not need to go back and create any adaptations or accommodations. So a student coming into a course that's completely universally designed, uh, maybe that student has uh, a certain disability, but because of the courses are ahead of time already made accessible, there's no need to alter anything for the student. The student can access the information and, and move right along with his day, his or her day. Okay, So that, that's the idea. Of course, not a perfect, in a perfect world, it would happen every time. Um, but you know, this is something that that I know I work towards, and many people work towards in higher ed. Now, uh, we take it really takes into account different styles of learning as we apply universal design to learning, UDL, or universal design for instruction, also known as UDI. Uh, you might see those acronyms here and there. Um, you know, the manipulation of materials and so on provides multiple ways by which students can access materials, access information. Uh, so. You know, really, in the end, what we're trying to do is create flexible environments, flexible materials, not something that's so rigid that it can't be changed, but something that can be molded and shaped to fit the needs of different learners. Um, so, for example, using different kinds or many kinds of instructional materials in a course, textbooks, um, lecture materials, ebooks, audio recordings, okay? These things appeal to multiple types of learning preferences. Not only a student, a student with a disability might not be, likely is not the only person in the classroom who would benefit from the availability of these materials. Um, so this increases the chances that every student can be more successful. Okay? Um, the use of digital text in addition to printed materials is a big one. Um, the use of something, if you're familiar with um, smart pens. Smart pens are used if you scroll use the pen, it's, it's a light pen, and you go over a piece of text, it records that text, and then it'll repeat it, uh, uh, and you'll have, the rec it'll record it and repeat it uh, as a spoken word, okay? So this is something that I see a lot of students on, on Wayne State's campus using nowadays. Um, but it, 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 and again, it's making the material more accessible. Uh, it's creating another, another path for students to access this material. Okay, um, and, and the advantage of having, uh, you know, a, for example, a textbooks available in an e-format. If you've ever, if, if any of you have uh, magazine subscriptions through on your iPads or tablets, uh, I, I subscribe to some magazines on there. You can not only read the magazine, but then the links are live. You can click on hyperlinks, watch videos. Okay, so it opens up a whole other world of possibilities here. Okay. Uh, some other benefits of universal design, uh, more choices, uh, encourage students to engage in the course more. If, the student, if a student has the ability to access material through many different ways, okay, one of them is going to appeal to the student over, over another. It's going to make them you know, understand that they have a choice in the course. I'm like, oh, I can either have the e-textbook or the regular textbook, or I can access lectures later um, through an audio recording or on a web, you know, on the Blackboard or on the website, what have you. Uh, students are going to take ownership over these materials. You know, they're going to they're going to uh, have greater control over them, uh, and they're going to be more engaged, more active in the course, which we know leads to uh, greater learning. It leads to greater course success. Okay, and a lot of this can also lead to more creative ways to interact with information, new concepts, uh, it boosts creativity, it boosts collaboration, um, you know, and really involves everyone in a course, in a classroom, okay. Um, UDL also impacts on learning and course success is measured. So uh, I think I mentioned it earlier um, that many faculty that I've spoken to who have, uh, you know, started utilizing different universal design concepts in their classes, in their, in their, in their, whether it's an online course or an in-person course in the classroom, um, they've developed a, different ways to assess learning. Okay, so it's not only your, you know, pull out your Scantron, we're going to do 200 multiple choice questions, um, you know, Bueller, it's not the mundane, it, it really gives faculty empowerment as well, and teachers empowerment in K-12 
that, well, if I can have the student, you know, recite to me or tell me orally or complete an essay, create a podcast style uh, response to a set of questions. Um, you know, you can really look at the extent to which the, the, the student has uh, uh, absorbed the material and understand it. Okay. Um, and again, it, this, uh, the, the whole thrust of this is to address the needs of diverse learners. Um, it can enhance the instructor's approaches to instructional design and delivery, which is, again, beneficial for everyone in the classroom. And that the picture on here is of my daughter, um, where she has more paint on her face than she does on her hands. She was a very, very creative uh, learner in preschool as well. Okay, so really just kind of putting this all together, um, going back what we discussed uh, so far here, uh, students with disabilities are obviously accessing higher education at increasing rates. Okay, uh, college faculty and staff, um, there, there's a growing need for them to engage these students early and often um, to, to improve their communication, to really look at the way that they are uh, working with students, the way that they're presenting their material, uh, writing their material. Uh, is it accessible? You know, um, they're not, they're all, of course, their own knowledge of the accommodation process. Um, for students who aren't yet on campus, um, we need more PSE options in Michigan. Bottom line, we need to really work on our existing resources. We have a lot of excellent educational resources in Michigan. It's a matter of looking at what we have, looking at how we can expand what we have, and then also looking creatively at, you know, how can we create more options. Um, and again, you know, I, I want a major barrier that I, I find uh, that I hear from families a lot is, is um, uh, region, regionality or uh, uh, geographic geographic barriers. Michigan's a very big state. Uh, as you know, if you live outside of Southeast Michigan, most of Michigan is very rural. Um, so, you know, having a PSE option, say in the Grand Rapids area, may not be realistic for someone who's, uh, you know, for example, living up in Rapid River or in uh, uh, Alpena, you know. So we need to expand these options. Let's bring them. We have, we have many fantastic uh, community colleges in Michigan as well as uh, some of the best universities in the, in the country. You know, we need to work with those resources and, and make some noise and say, hey, we have these students, um, you know, that can benefit from these programs. Uh, that will go on to do great things. And I just think we need to, to really start highlighting these things a lot more in our work. Um, so, and then finally, the use of universally designed course materials, uh, universally designed uh, lectures, classrooms, so on and so forth, benefits all students, bottom line. Um, you know, it's, not some, it's, it's something that's going to greatly enhance uh, the experience of students with, with various developmental and intellectual disabilities. But it's going to benefit all students. It's going to benefit education as a whole. Um, it's just a matter of really getting that information out there. Uh, I have a few resources here, uh, a couple links. Of course, this, this whole presentation is going to be downloadable from the um, webinar archive page. Okay, So if you're frantically writing down these links, don't worry about it. You're going to be able to grab these. They'll, they'll be live in the presentation as well. You can just click on them and check them out. Um, the National Center on Universal for, uh, Design for Learning is a great resource if you have questions about, you know, further questions about what does universal design look like. It uh, gives a lot of great uh, examples. Of course, our website's on here. Uh, Learning Disability Association of Michigan has many uh, excellent educational uh, links on there as well, uh, resources, um, different things that, that that organization does across the state to um, try to make post-secondary education more accessible and, and, and more of an option. Um, and, and also to help students, specifically in their case uh, with learning disabilities, who do make up the largest percentage of students that are on college campuses. Most students with disabilities who are on a college campus uh, right now uh, report having some form of learning disability. Okay, So they're, they're a great organization to check out. Uh, Think College, whom I mentioned before, uh, Michigan College Access Network, if you're not familiar with them, you need to be. They are a fantastic organization that 
works to enhance and, and um, really uh, make college going a priority for all students in Michigan. Okay, several fantastic resources on their website. I uh, highly suggest you check them out. A um, couple others here. If you want to learn more about uh, Section uh, 5, that's the 5 later, 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, um, uh, the ADA, National Center on Accessible Instruction is another great one. That's aim.cast.org. Um, they have plenty of resources, videos. Uh, you know, different things that, that look at uh, how to make instructional materials more accessible. And this can go beyond the college classroom or the, or the high school classroom. If you are someone like myself who provides uh, training uh, and different presentations, this will give this some nice tips on here on how to make your presentation uh, as accessible as possible, uh, as usable as possible. Okay. Um, so, Two more things here, um, and I'm going to post again. This this will be sent out. The directions. This is the uh, activity for this week, um, and then after this, I'm going to show uh, one of our possibilities videos as we end of, uh, of Abby. Uh, Abby is uh, an individual with uh, Down syndrome who lives in the Brighton area, uh, who takes courses at Washtenaw Community College. It's just a nice story to kind of wrap things up that we're talking about today. You can also access that video through DDI website um, in our possibilities videos page as well. Um, so, that, so the activity this week, uh, I want you to go visit thinkcollege.net um, and like I showed you, find a, click on the find a college button in the upper right corner of the site and search for two different PSC programs. It can be from any state. Uh, there are a couple hundred different programs to choose from in that mix, uh, but find two in particular that are operating somewhere, and please list two similarities and two differences differences between these programs. Um, you know, a lot of the programs share, for example, um, the fact that they're inclusive, that students are learning alongside their their non-disabled peers, um, that they're part of the college. Uh, they participate in all the activities and so on. That's one similarity I think you'll find between most of the programs. But and they, a lot of them are very different in many ways as well. So you can do that and list those. And again, of course, you know, return it to DDI um, by email or fax uh, uh, by Tuesday of next week, which is April 29th at 5 p.m. Um, so are there any questions before I move on to Abby's video? I think this is all I have this week for you. Uh, I hope the information was uh, very useful for you. Um, at the very tail end of the slide here, I have a couple, I list my references for this presentation. Uh, if you're looking for uh, any research in this area, uh, hopefully that's helpful as well. Um, so any questions right now? You can fire away. I don't see any yet. Um, I'll check back before we wrap up, but I'm going to go ahead and, and click over to um, Abby's video here for you. Uh, it, it's a good example of an option that this family chose. Um, it, it'll explain in the video, but Abby's a young lady who really wanted to uh, go into child care. Um, so she was able to uh, take some courses at Washtenaw Community College, and she, uh, it, it, when the video was filmed here, she's working in a daycare center. Um, so I will let this play for you, and I'll wrap up at the tail end, okay? I just wanted Abby to be treated with the utmost respect, given the opportunity to live a life that was full and had meaning and be able to give back to a world that she lived in. Abby is a remarkable young woman who over the years has never ceased to amaze us in terms of the things that she's achieved. Abby is an Down syndrome adult. She's an adult who happens to have Down syndrome. 
we had been told that Abby would go to a school in a neighboring town, and we didn't want that for her. We bought our home in Brighton because they have exemplary schools, and that's where we wanted her to go to school. I think early on some of the obstacles were teachers and administrators that didn't have the same vision that Luann and I had. It was quite a process to work with them and to encourage them to see the same things and the same potential that we saw in Abby. The challenges were like the upfront work because a lot of people, if you just caught them off guard and said, I would like to have my daughter, you know, attend your Montessori school, their knee jerk reaction was no. We started ahead of time, a year and a half or two years before, and kind of let people know what was going on, introduce Abby ahead of time, give them an opportunity to, to get a feel for what she really was about and what she could bring in, into the school or preschool or whatever it was. This goal of inclusion having her in the regular classroom with her same age peer students and not segregating her into a special ed room. A typical day would be she works at the preschool from about 9.30 to 11.15. I love um, preschool a lot. What I like over there is kids having fun and just working in your life. She's actually assisting, like she really has a role. And so I think it's given her encouragement to see that she can do things independently. She gets delighted to see the children and that she's giving back. She will continue to work at preschool, just kind of continue what any typical person at 20 would do. Maybe have a part-time job and go to school. She has two hours with her tutor, um, working on uh, reading comprehension skills and writing and math. She has two hours there and then she uh, takes two dance classes at Washington Community College. Um, one of them is uh, dance exercise, and the other one is hip hop. Well, um, I like to dance. It's really about like your life. Dancing has to be like my passion. Really, with Abby, there is no difference from any of the other students. In some ways, Abby is more focused and comes to class sometimes more ready than a lot of my students. Abby really has a gift for dance. She has an intuitive sense of rhythm, those things that you can't teach, Abby has naturally. I think it's a wonderful thing to have her in class. I think it's wonderful for her and it's wonderful for the rest of the students. We come home, make dinner, sometimes we walk the dog, sometimes we'll play we. We just kind of have a typical evening. I think it's really important for parents and teachers to view people with disabilities as people first. Learn to understand your child. Learn to appreciate what they value and what their interests are. And, and don't give up. Help them to see themselves as a valuable member of society. Give them opportunities to grow. This was our goal for her to um, be educated in the regular classroom. Um, with supports that were needed, whatever those were, and um, and to help her be the best that she could be, which is what we want for all of our children. Okay. Um, well, if there's no more questions, I'm I'm done today. Thank you all for participating. Um, again, I'll leave the uh, <clears throat> assignment up here, but that'll be sent out uh, probably later on today or tomorrow morning, along with the rest of the materials and the link to the archived uh, video of the uh, webinar today. So uh, thank you again. And just a reminder, next week is week nine, the last webinar uh, for this series. Um, Andre Robinson will be speaking about self-advocacy and uh, his experience as a, a gentleman with disabilities. So thank you very much and we'll talk to you soon.